You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. Before we get into today's episode, I want to tell you a little bit about our current sponsors, uh, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. As you well know, if you've been following This Is Oklahoma, they've been a huge part of this podcast. So this podcast is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, telling an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com and follow them on Instagram for daily updates at Oklahoma HOF. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This Is Oklahoma. Mike Hoon here, your host back with another episode down in Oklahoma City today at Chickasaw Community Bank right off Meridian where I mean as we've just been speaking when I first landed here and drove up Meridian um, I didn't realize I'd probably come back here one day and be doing a podcast <laughs> uh, but yeah I mean 10 years ago and I, I, I this place is home to me now I love it um, but my guest today is T.W. Shannon um, Chief Executive Officer of the bank. I'm glad your nameplate's there because I would have forgot that, but I'm reading it on your nameplate, which is good. <laughs> uh, but we're not just going to talk about just the bank. We're going to talk about yourself, your upbringing, all the cool things you've been doing. Um, I think we're going to touch on your fashion sense because every time fashion I see you, sense. you're extremely well-dressed. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of things that, go, that, that, that you do. Uh, and, you know, and, and one of the things that I, I caught on to early on was just how much you invest, I think, the bank invests in social media and, mm. and how you get navigate that as a bank because there's a lot out there that don't do that. Um, so that's one of the things that I caught on. But thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, safe travels, obviously, for the rest of today. I know, I know you're busy and, and, and heading out of town, but glad to fit this one in. Um, I mean, what's the current State of the Union? How's things at the moment? Man, I tell you what, we are having an amazing time here at Chickasaw Community Bank. Uh, we just broke ground uh, this year on a new headquarters building. Uh, we are uh, opening a, a, a new branch location uh, mm-hmm. very soon. We had record growth last year, and uh, this year is, is going like gangbusters. We're, we're just, it's really blessed, and uh, it reminds, it's just been really good affirmation that yeah, our yeah. mission of building better lives for everyone, it's amazing how when you do that, yeah, all, everything else seems to, to fall into place and work out well. So we've got a great team. Uh, I've got the best team this side of heaven, I always yeah. like to say, and so uh, things are really good right now, and, and, and from a, a personal sense, I've, I've got a wonderful wife who's teaching at the University of of Oklahoma, uh, my kids, my daughter's 16 and my son is 12 and mm-hmm. they're thriving. So uh, this is a good season uh, for, yeah. for, for me and for the bank right now. Did you think growing up that you'd be in banking? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> That's boring. Why yeah. do I want to do that? Yeah, I, I, I didn't, you know, I, I, I probably didn't do as good a job of balancing my checkbook as I should have mm-hmm. as a young man. Um, I, I, I've always been scared of the question you know, where do you see yourself in five years? Because yeah. I never have a good answer for that. I don't think that way. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, and it's not that I'm a by the seat of your pants type guy. I'm a big visionary person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the details can sometimes overwhelm me. I have to force myself to work on the details. Yeah. Uh, so when you, you know, as a, as a kid, did I see myself as a banker? No way. No way yeah. at all. I, but I always knew that I wanted to live in Oklahoma. Um, I knew I wanted to be a married man and I knew I would you know have a church family somewhere yeah, yeah. and I knew I would be working uh, those were the probably the things that I knew uh, but other than that no yeah. no idea at all and you grew up in Lawton right I did yeah tell me about that take us there so so I, I grew up I was actually born here in Oklahoma City and mm-hmm. lived here through sixth grade um, in sixth grade uh, my dad made a real uh, life-changing decision. Uh, both my parents are grad- college graduates. They both yeah. graduated from Langston University, our only historically black college and university mm-hmm. in the state. Um, and they were, I have a sister who's 12 years older than I am. Okay. Um, and so I was really raised as an only kid, but in 2000, because my sister was just so much older, she's more mm-hmm. like a second mom. Yeah, yeah. We're super close. Um, and uh, when I was in sixth grade, my parents, they figured out parenting real early they were amazing parents they had to learn marriage a little bit better you know yeah. they just uh, they would split up quite a bit and, and for a while there uh, my parents were split up but dad was always around he was never an absent person I, mm-hmm. I saw him every week saw him you know nearly daily uh, but in sixth grade he really rededicated his t- life to the Lord mm-hmm. and I uh, got serious about his faith uh, we moved to Lawton 
Uh, he was having a hard time finding a job. He's a teacher, yeah. uh, but he could get a job in Lawton teaching. Mom was a social worker. She transferred her job to Lawton, uh, and we started getting serious about you know attending church and, and Bethlehem Baptist Church. It's a church my dad grew up in, where my grandfather was a deacon. We got real active there, and our lives changed. I mean, yeah. overnight, I saw the difference of what it means when you have a strong. Um, man who is committed to the family and is mm-hmm. is one hundred percent vested in his faith and his family. Like I got to see it firsthand. I knew what it looked like before. Yeah, and I got yeah, to see yeah. it afterwards, and uh, that always had a, a, a real impact on me. Yeah, it's cool to see that because a lot of kids grow up, they don't know the before, do That's they? Right, right? because That's a right. kid comes along and that kid is the life changing moment, yeah. and, and the parent or significant other, or whoever it is decides I need to make a change now and then you don't see that but you've got to see that and, and see that work right and see you know mentioning the church and, and with the Lord and working through that you get yeah. to see that change right and then you know for most people sons right they look up to their dad mm-hmm. absolutely right? so you get to see that firsthand, which is a special it, it, it is special and you know d- d- I always say I had the parents that every kid deserves mm-hmm. I mean and they I never once wondered if I was their number one priority. I never once wondered about safety. I never right. worried about provision. I didn't get everything I wanted as a right. kid. Um, I'm not saying that at all. We weren't we weren't rich by any stretch of the imagination. My parents were working class mm-hmm. uh, people, and 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 they made me a priority. And I, and I had, a, I had a terrific upbringing. I had a lot of extended family, but more yeah. importantly. I had a church family, like 250, you know, predominantly African American church, uh, about 250, 300 a Sunday, and they held me accountable. Mm-hmm. Like, like there, I wasn't just parents. Like, I had a whole community of people yeah. that were rooting for me. And when you're when you're an African American boy, and if you if you if you have kind of a big personality like I do, mm-hmm. and you you like to be up front and do that stuff, uh, what people always tell you in a black church is you're going to be a preacher. You're going to be a preacher. <laughs> Uh, and, and so I heard that my entire life. I knew God didn't call me to be a preacher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I also knew what they meant. They meant in our community, this is the most esteemed position. Mm-hmm. And we think you have the potential to reach that. And I didn't understand that. Right. In, in retrospect, I, I can kind of look back and understand that as a 12 year old, I was just flattered yeah. that anybody thought that. Uh, but what that also told to me was. There were people outside of my mom and dad who had an expectation of me. Mm-hmm. I had a community that expected me to do things. And so that meant that I couldn't I couldn't just, you know, do whatever I wanted as a young right. man. I, I knew that there were people Lawton's a small enough town where yeah. uh, there was real accountability and, and I and I and I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful right. for the people of that church because it just man, I am who I am because yeah. of that church. And frankly, that's where I got my conservative values from. People mm-hmm. ask me all the time about, you know, where did you, was it yeah. Was it Abraham Lincoln? Was it Ronald Reagan? Was it, you know, even a mentor like J.C. Watts that I had? Uh-huh. And yes, they all have had an inspiration. But frankly, my conservative values, I got them from my predominantly African-American church, yeah. Bethlehem Baptist Church, uh, where I saw men who were like my dad, committed to the Lord, committed mm-hmm. to their faith, their, their families, and their community. Yeah, that's the childhood that I had. That's the example that I grew up with. So right. that's what I've come to uh, uh, enjoy, uh, accept, and, and frankly, now I'm trying to promote too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so when you know you, you, people are telling you this when you're 12, right, that you're yeah. going to be a preacher, or you're going to be at a person of influence in the community. Where does it take you? What does your mind think? Like, and you said, like, I'm not going to be a preacher, but you're going to be something. Yeah. What was like your boyhood dream at that point? Then you know what I what I always thought I wanted to do. Um, I was never good at sports. I, I played football up through up until high school. Um, I didn't really. I never really thrived at it, yeah. you know, and I enjoyed I enjoyed the camaraderie, the, the, the sportsmanship, the the goofing off mm-hmm. in the locker room. I mean, all that stuff yeah. was fun, but I never really thrived at it. Um, but but I did have um, uh, a lot of a lot of people that I felt expected something of me. And so, you know, the scripture to whom much is given, much is required. I felt like there was a lot required of me. I knew yeah. that that I had you know, some some experiences that were different than what I was reading about. You know, you always hear about and read about, and both my parents were uh, history majors, and they were particularly interested in black history. So I knew the struggles of African Americans and, and yeah. what what um, our experiences in America had been, and even before. 
and I, and I also knew the contemporary. I've always I've always been interested in, mm-hmm. in in news. Even as a kid, I knew what the contemporary narrative is for African American males and right. and the the challenges that that face us statistically. Mm-hmm. And I knew at twelve, this life that I'm experiencing is different. Like like I'm there's not a right. there's not a absent father. There's not an absence of fathers or great role models. I had a church full of them. I had yeah. a church full of strong men who, um, who you, you were joking about fashion. It, it, it was a fashion show at church. You <laughs> right. know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, we had guys in, in lime green suits and purple suits. And, uh, but I also knew that, that there was more to it than that, that you could mm-hmm. celebrate your individuality through fashion yeah. and so forth. But, that didn't define who you were. Like all of those men, you know, right. Deacon Dewberry, who was in his 90s and still wearing, you know, fuchsia suits on Sunday, or or Deacon Sneed, who's now in his 90s, yeah. uh, who's still around, and you know, he he was another colorful person. Like yeah, they they were a bit ostentatious in their yeah. dress and their presentation, but they were men of great depth and and thought mm-hmm. and wisdom, and, and that, that's always stuck with me. Yeah. Well, like, like you just mentioned, right, that was unique, wouldn't it, growing up with that community because of the church family in your situation. When you're looking at the stats, right, and you're like, that, this isn't me, right? This isn't, this isn't yeah. you know, okay, it may, the stats say this is, you know, what should be like what is right now but that's not what i'm used to because like i said you have strong men around you who are pushing individuality as a community and just saying if you want to be who you are you know you do the right thing yeah you know like this if you don't grow up in that situation you become one of those statistics don't you and it's very easy to slip and find and and you know like i said you don't have a father in the in the house or whatever statistic it is and it seems like you know, we are fighting against that statistic every day. You know, yeah. you know, not just black families, white families. It's everybody. It's Native families, Everybody. Yeah. And it's great to see that. And if it's not just the church, it might be a boys and girls club mm-hmm. or whatever it is. Right. It's awesome to see people, especially in Oklahoma, come together and do that. And, and it's been a pleasure for me to, you know, kind of be a witness to it by doing the podcast as well. It, it, it is it, because that, I think when you, when you boil it all down, sorry, mm-hmm. I think when you boil it all down, um, you know, there's so much, and, and, and we learned through the pandemic, right? I think mm-hmm. the pandemic really brought a lot of it yeah. home. When you boil it all down, people are in search of that community. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, I think social media has given us a false sense of community, yeah. that, that we think we have a community there. But the problem with that is, you know, community by definition involves the exchange of empathy, mm-hmm. right? I think we have a shortage of empathy in the right. world right now. And social media, the reason it is not sufficient to replace traditional community, mm-hmm. while there are some good things about social media, I'm on it, I'm, right. I'm active, and I, I think there's value, uh, but it doesn't replace that community because in a community, in relationship, which is really what people are after, um, not only is there accountability, but there is an exchange of empathy, right? On right. social media, I can get on and post a pretty picture of my beautiful kids yeah. and my wonderful dog and my amazing wife and get all this validation and, mm-hmm. and, and acceptance and, and affirmation, but I never have a responsibility to give anything back. Right. In a community, yes, you can receive all of that love and affirmation mm-hmm. like I did, but there's also an expectation. There's right. an expectation that you give some of it back, that yeah. you're that there's gratitude, mm-hmm. um, and then that also that you reach back and give something to the people coming behind you. Gotcha. Like, like that's, I think that's the missing ingredient in our, um, in our, in our, you know, world and society right now. And that's why I love the work that we're doing at Chickasaw Community Bank because right. our mission is building better lives for everyone. And it's not just the bottom line. Mm-hmm. Yes, we are concerned about the bottom line. But as a CEO, you know, a lot of decisions come across my desk every right. day. But a lot more decisions get made before they get to my desk. Usually if it gets to my desk, it's a big decision or it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And what I try to do um, when I'm having a decision and kind of using a rubric to make a decision is 
Does it add to the bottom line? Yes, I have to be concerned with that as the CEO. That's yeah. just we have investors. You know, yeah, we're on a business. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. We, they, we have our shareholders who expect us to turn a profit. We're not a not profit. Not yeah. for, a not for profit. We are a for profit organization. But the second piece that I asked with that, and I think maybe I'm trying to drive down to every level. Mm-hmm. Level is. Does it add to the bottom line? And then the second question is, does it add to our culture? Mm-hmm. Uh, culture is behavior. Yeah. Values are ideas and, and, and thoughts, and, and frankly, um, um, you know, they're, they're really, values are really um, ideas that you have, but culture is the behavior. Mm-hmm. And if something adds to the bottom line and it adds to our culture, yeah. that's an easy, yeah. easy yes. But whether you're talking about hiring someone or or relieving someone, or you're talking about investing in new products and services, or or new offerings, those are the kind of criteria that I use. Does it add to the bottom line? Does it add to our culture? If it's both, that's easy. Right. But usually, it's one or the other. If it gets to my desk, yeah. um, and I try to lean toward culture. If it's going to add to our culture, mm-hmm. I try to be a yes every time, yeah, even yeah. even at the expense sometimes of profit. Right, because in the short term it's an expense, right? But in the long term, it's an investment. It, it, an investment, it yeah. pays off, and it's training your staff, and you know, and probably it's t- taking a while for you to train yourself to be like you know, to not think of that short term. And like you mentioned, sh- shareholders and the bank in general, you're like, yeah. you know, I'm sure you've had this been situations you've had to do a lot of explaining, and Absolutely. like, hey, this makes this doesn't make sense right now, but in five, six, however many months or years it's going to make total sense and then you're on that building train. That's right. So I'll I'll give you a great example of where that value system, Mm -hmm. uh, culture, and and bottom line really came into place. It was during this pandemic when we were faced with the idea of the PPP, uh, which the payroll protection uh, program, which, you know, got a lot of attention, which helped out a lot of businesses Mm -hmm. around the country uh, after governments forced them to shut down. Right. You know, it was it was a new system. There wasn't even guidance on it. It was legislation that had been passed less than a week. Mm-hmm. And we had to decide if, in fact, we were going to participate in it, yeah. even though there's no guidance, even though there's no there was a lot of uh, a lot of our team was 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 hesitant, was was reticent, you know, and, and there and rem- remind you, we're not immune from what's happening. People here had sick family members. They were scared about employment and kids being educated. I mean, we all had that going on. And so the question was, are we going to participate? Are we going to do it? And I would say maybe a majority of our team had major reservations yeah. about it. And and I tend to be a consensus builder. It's in my nature. And so I, I rely a lot on my team. I'm not a, uh, a hothead who goes off on his own very much. I mean, I, I can make a decision, but I, I, I much more prefer collaboration right. kind of as a default. And I, I, I didn't poll it exactly, but I didn't feel like everyone was saying, yeah, let's go jump into this new, yeah. this new program by the federal government you know that by the SBA that we we have no absolutely no idea how it's going to work, how we're going to get repaid, right. what's involved. And I remember you know pausing and praying about it and just thinking, okay, if we're a community bank like we say we are, and we our community is now in need, mm-hmm. like we can be helpful. Will this add to the bottom line? I hope so. I think mm-hmm. it will. They you know I got to believe it will, but there's a good chance it may not. Yeah. Does it add to our culture? And I just thought if our if our employees are out there on the front lines helping mm-hmm. businesses stay open, to grow, to survive, right. I think that's going to add. And sure enough, um, I can get emotional just thinking about it. You know, we made the decision to do it. And then all of a sudden, you may recall the two big defell banks mm-hmm. were deciding not to do it. And then they said they would do it, but they would only offer it to current customers right. of a certain network or value. So you had all of these people yeah. that didn't qualify. And and we stepped up like most, and I'm, we're not unique in that. I'm not, mm-hmm. you're not telling us on the, I'm not trying to, you know, overstate kind of our, yeah. our involvement, but like most community banks, we stepped up to the plate and said, we're doing this. We're mm-hmm. committed because it's good for our community. And I think it was the right decision. Yeah, yeah. And as a result, we haven't had any, you know, any uh, major issues. For defaults, we had a record year in 2020. Yeah. And I think 2021 is going to be a big year for us, right. too. Because so. then, then that pays off. It builds and That's people right. trust you. And more new customers. Word yep. gets around. It's, like I said, it, it kind of snowballs from there. Uh, going back, though, to high school, 
Wait, I mean, when 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 you're in that locker room and you realize I'm probably not going to go to the league, I need to figure something out. I'm not an athlete, but people expect much of, much of me. Education is probably big as well. Do you go to university, and where mm-hmm. do you go? I went to Cameron University there okay. in Lawton. Yeah, uh, as a four year. I was real um, uh, pragmatic about college. Mm-hmm. I just thought. You know, I had decent grades, and I thought, where can I go the yeah. cheapest? You know, um, and Cameron offered me the Presidential Leaders University Scholarship, the Plus Scholarship, mm-hmm. and uh, so I went there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you know what you wanted to study when you when you step on campus freshman year, or did you kind of just figure it out? And I knew that I didn't want to do accounting, and so I thought, <laughs> what, what's a major? What's a major yeah. that I could avoid accounting in? Right. Now I'm a banker, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I majored in. Uh, communication, speech communication. Got gotcha. you. Because I figured out in high school I was a pretty decent writer, mm-hmm. and I thought well, maybe I can write speeches for a living. Right. I thought I can. I, I've always enjoyed kind of the, the the mass media stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I knew I could write, um, and I thought that was a. I noticed a, a lot of people weren't writing as much anymore, sure. and I thought I could kind of be distinguished there mm-hmm. with my writing. And so I majored in speech communication, never dreaming that I would, you know, probably be given as many yeah. speeches as I do now. Right? So, yeah, yeah. And, uh, to that point, right? And like, I think I think something that people, when we grow up, right, it's something that you sh- you don't enjoy doing, right? You fear standing on a stage and giving a speech to somebody, but you know it. There's so many instances where we are given the opportunity to do that, right? And it's like I said, it's the people who stand up and want to do that and are comfortable with their words, whatever it is, standing mm-hmm. in front of a crowd, in front of a camera, on TV, whatever it is. I mean, there's nothing cooler, I think, to me than seeing yourself being like taking that role and having that self confidence to say, you know what, someone's going to ask me things on live TV and I'm going to be able to answer everything I can. And if I'm not, we're going to figure out why I can't and answer them that way. But that one must have been really cool to go through that to that like, kind of mass media and, and learn those skills, mm-hmm. right? Because, you know, we've probably spoken to a lot of reporters and the skills that they do, I mean, that's a job that takes, oh, absolutely. it's unbelievable, isn't it? The stuff that they do and on camera, reading the props and, and, and they do everything behind the camera as well. Uh, but it's really cool to have that kind of bond with them when they're asking you questions because you understand everything that they've done. For sure. Um, to be in that situation, but so so you do you you go to camera and you you know you enjoy it. You kind of find your role and you think I'm going to go write for people. Is that still kind of like the the path after like senior year, thinking of where am yeah. I going to get a job now? So it was interesting. So I see I worked nearly full time during high school, yeah. and then I worked full time in college. Mm-hmm. Uh, my first job in high school was on my birthday. I got hired at Burger King to yeah. work the drive through uh, And then that summer, I, I, my birthday's in February, and then that summer I picked up a second job mm-hmm. working at the movie theater that was just open. So I worked two jobs you yeah. know, during the summer and then worked nearly full time. And the only reason was, I wish I could tell you it was more noble. You know, I was helping my parents. And <laughs> yeah. it, it wasn't that at all. Right. Uh, the only reason was uh, I wanted a certain particular car and I liked clothes that my parents wouldn't buy me. Right. Uh, that was my sole uh, yeah, yeah. reason for, for, for working all those hours. And so when I was working at Cameron, when I was going to school at Cameron, I was also working full time. Mm-hmm. Um, and and my senior year, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, and I had so I applied to law school not because I wanted to quote be a lawyer. Yeah. I applied to law school because it was just cool when people ask, "Well, what are you doing?" You said, "Well, I've applied to law school." You know, it sounds <laughs> yeah, real. Right. Sounds real uh, easy you know, to defer the yeah, question. I've yeah, applied to law school. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and not knowing that the minute you become an attorney, people are like, "Oh my gosh, you're an attorney! Get away!" You know, <laughs> like the plague. But uh, funny how that just reverses. Yeah. But um, so I, I applied to law school. I've been accepted to, um, I received a letter of acceptance from Howard University Mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. It was my senior year, uh, and I had been praying also. I knew God didn't call me to be a single man, Mm -hmm. and so I had been praying. I wanted to meet my wife. I I wasn't necessarily ready to get married, but I wanted her to be an Oklahoma girl. I thought I was going to go to Washington, D.C., because I got accepted to Howard Law School, and I thought, well, that would put me closer to writing speeches for maybe the president Mm -hmm. one day. Um, That was my thought. And and but in April, it's April, and I'm thinking, well, I'm I'm about to graduate. I'm probably not going to meet a girl from Oklahoma because you know, long and small enough, right. you yeah, figure yeah. you know everybody in your age group. And that's when I saw my wife mm-hmm. walking across the campus, literally, and I the world stopped spinning, and yeah, I knew yeah. 
that's the woman I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. And so I went up to her and I introduced myself. Um, and she, she said, hi. And that was it. And then the next day, um, I went and I knocked on the door mm-hmm. of her classroom because I was late and she was already in class. And yeah. I thought, I've got to I've got to meet her, you know, because I didn't even know her at the time right. other than the, the name. And so I knocked on the door of the class and I asked the professor if I could speak to the young lady on the front row. <laughs> and uh, she steps out. Yeah. And, and I said, uh, may I? May I please have your phone number? And uh, she said, "I'm sorry, I have a boyfriend." Yeah. So of course I'm devastated. Crushed. I didn't let her know. Yeah. I looked, I looked cool and yeah. and like cool, calm, and collected, which is kind of my that's my that's my superpowers. I always right. look pretty cool and calm. And, I say it's like a like I tell my team here, it's like being a duck. Yeah, you know, you look cool and calm on top of the water, but underneath there's a lot yeah. of so yeah, 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 so yeah. I looked like I was calm, but I was really devastated. But unbeknownst to me. While we had moved out of kind of eye shot and ear shot of her class, mm-hmm. we had stepped into ear shot of two other classes in the communications department. She was a freshman at the yeah. time. Uh, she's three years younger than I. And and uh, these other two classes, they they saw my humiliation, and they felt so sorry for me. Yeah. And because I, you know, I've been in the in the department for yeah. four years, so I knew a lot of people. Uh, they all started advocating for. Oh, you should give him a shot. He, he's a nice guy. <laughs> he's a nice guy. And her. Um, and I didn't. I, it wasn't a campaign. I didn't do that yeah. on purpose. It just kind of organically happened, mostly. Yeah. Uh, but she did. Her boyfriend. He was in high school still. Yeah. Because uh, they. She was a freshman, and he was still in high school. So he didn't have a car. He didn't have a chance. Yeah. He didn't have a shot. So three weeks later, she sent me her number, and um, and I, I um, she sent me her number three weeks later. A year and a half later, we were married. But yeah. in that time, though, that summer, I was looking for an additional. I'd always worked kind of two jobs in the summer. I was going away to college. I figured I needed some more money. Mm-hmm. And so I was applying everywhere. And I saw this seal. I knew it was a federal government seal. My parents, yeah. to their credit, you know, it's not good advice now, but coming from where they were, they always told me, go to college, mm-hmm. doesn't matter what you major in, and get a good government job. That's what yeah. they told me. It's just a security. You know, I think for African right. Americans, the government's always been kind of a place of security. Sure. Um, and so I saw this seal that I thought was just, I knew it was a federal seal. I didn't know what kind of seal. Yeah. I didn't know there were different federal seals. So I walk in, and there's this... You know, well-dressed African American gentleman there, mm-hmm. and his name is J. C. Watts. He had an office in Lawton, yeah. and uh, we, I told him I was going to college, going to D.C. and I and I didn't know who he was. He was already the fourth-ranking member of Congress at right. the time, uh, but I didn't know. I didn't have any political yeah. kind of leanings or even interests. Uh, but I fi- I don't know how I figured it out. I, I want to say I went home and googled it, but I don't know that. We were Googling it. Right. This would have been 19... Your parents might have been like, 2000. who did you meet today? Or yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, but anyway, but I quickly figured out somehow that he's the fourth ranking member of Congress. He's in D.C. Mm-hmm. I'm headed to D.C. Maybe I can work in his office there. Well, he didn't have any positions there. Yeah. He had a uh, job on his campaign here in Oklahoma. And I thought, well, that would be cool. And I had also applied, right. just kind of, someone had gave me the advice, apply locally. You don't ever sure. know what could happen. So I applied to OCU School of Law. Mm-hmm. And I had been accepted there, and I thought, well, I can work for And they had a night program. Yeah. So I worked for the congressman during the day, mm-hmm. and then I went to law school at night because Devin was still here. Yeah. She had a full-ride scholarship to Cameron gotcha. as well. She's the first person in her family on either side to go to college. Yeah. And so all that's happening like from April to June. Like, yeah. like meet a girl, fall in love. Not going to D.C. anymore. Not going to D.C., Working for uh, you know the fourth ranking yeah. member of Congress, and so I decided to do that. And uh, a year later, Devin and I were married. Yeah, uh, we've been we just celebrated twenty years of marriage uh, in August. Congrats! That's Thank huge, you. Huge, isn't it? And yeah. now you have two kids together. And two kids. Audrey is sixteen, and yeah. Tarahan is twelve, and uh, we're we're very blessed. They are they are amazing children. That's awesome. So I guess from that point, then you realize like your passion for politics, because you're in you're in the thick of it, then, yeah. right? Yeah. You're not thinking. I mean, you're going to law school but at the same time you're spending all of your day in the thick of it around legislature and and politics and i mean that must have been exciting it was and and to tell you about politics i remember my first so my very first day on the job Mm -hmm. 
the Speaker of the House was coming into Oklahoma to do a fundraiser for yeah. JC. And so I was part of that. You know, I don't, I don't think I picked the Speaker up, but maybe I picked up some staff. Yeah, and yeah. it's an event. I mean, it's kind of got a picture with him. This is literally my first day on the job. Yeah. The second day on the job, to tell you about the extremes of politics, the second day, I was in Altus, Oklahoma. It must have been 115. <laughs> and I was putting up yeah. signs right. using, you know, stakes in the ground to put up yard signs around Altus, Oklahoma, you know, and and so that I think those were the first yeah. two, two ground days. Isn't, ground isn't very soft in Altus. It, it, is, it is not, especially <laughs> not. not in, this would have been hot. like June, so yeah, yeah, it is not soft at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, putting in those stakes, those, those signs. I mean, I kind of with open house signs or in real estate, they're all the kind of the same signs, and they those little metals, but they can do some damage to your hands. Post, oh, no oh, doubt. Oof, no, no, those post, those post drivers. Are, yeah. yeah, it was. It, so I, it just that, and that gave me um, a real sense of 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 how elections are run. Mm-hmm. But then I was just working for an incredible guy. So yeah. JC, uh, who remains a mentor of mine to this day. In fact, we now worship at the same church yeah. in Norman. Um, you know, I got to see because I, I guess like a lot of people, I was kind of although I didn't give politics much thought, I was probably a little cynical about elected officials and you know they don't care right. just a bunch of crooks up there looking out for themselves but then I meet this most maybe not maybe probably the most moral right m- man I've ever met in my life JC Watts is the most um, thoughtful um, um, deliberate mm person I've ever met in my life. I yeah. mean, he just, he is the real deal. He's a person of, of character who always thinks about the team first. And so I got to experience that firsthand yeah. because what I, in addition to working on his, first I worked on the campaign, then I worked on the congressional staff, but I also, he had a pack that he ran and he also, uh, he as the fourth ranking member of Congress, he was the mm-hmm. conference chairman. He was traveling the country doing fundraisers because he's one of the great orators of right. our time. And I was his travel companion, so I got to spend a lot of weekends mm-hmm. with him um, in different, you know, in Beverly Hills. I was, we were in, uh, you know, Naples, Florida. I mean, yeah. uh, all over the country, in, in small towns in Iowa and Illinois, you know, helping Republicans get elected. Yeah. And so, I got to spend a lot of time with him personally, and I realized a what an enormous sacrifice that mm-hmm. people like him serve at. I mean, this is a guy that. You know, could have been making a whole lot more money right. doing a lot of other things, but he was he was called and mm-hmm. choosing to do that line of work. And then I also got to see what a difference he was making mm-hmm. uh, for not just minority people, but you know, all Americans. And I think that's where I kind of got the bl- bug got about you. political. Yeah, and office. spending all that time with him and that casual mm-hmm. downtime on the road, like it, you get to like, you know, you get to meet the real person, the real right? person, yeah. And and then that kind of changes like like I said that stereotype that you thought he's a politician he's whatever like like yeah. I mean generally if you've never met a politician you would think the same thing yeah because um, that's just kind of like you said the stereotype is well, that I'm way, like the it? trifecta I'm a yeah. banker politician and attorney I mean yeah. you know, that, that's, that's you know that's a triple win <laughs> right. so. you haven't sold cars before have you because that's not, like kind of next I've, I've sold women's shoes though. okay I, I, I yeah. did that for a while I, I always figured man if you can't sell women's shoes, like yeah. that's the easiest job ever, right? Right. So, yeah. So you hit the road, you're traveling around, mm-hmm. and you really get the bug for politics. I did. Uh, you still studying and going to OCU at the time I am, as well. I am. Uh, work, JC was in office another two years before mm-hmm. he announced his retirement, and I remember well driving him to the announcement. And we didn't know what he was announcing. We knew he was announcing something. Yeah. We assumed it was to retire. Um, and in that announcement, he read. A letter. Mm -hmm. The letter he had received, he had become friends with Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. And she wrote him a letter and and he wound up leaving a copy like he like he often did a lot of things in my car. I think I still have it somewhere. A a copy, not the original one. But he read the letter at his announcement. Um, but the letter essentially closed with, you know, dear friend, I didn't give up my seat. Please don't give up yours. Yeah. This is from Rosa Parks, the right. godmother of the civil rights movement. And I think that was the moment where I realized what a difference one person can make. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what a, going back to that, um, you know, to whom much is given, much yeah. is required. I think that's when I realized at that moment, 
I think there's more for me to do here. Yeah. yeah. So like I said, you, you think this is mean. This is my path. This is kind of what everybody back to your church when you're growing up that said you're going to be in a place of influence. You're not, like I said, you might not be a preacher, but now you're mm-hmm. put in this position um, through hard work, meeting the right people, timing, luck, whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, obviously, hard work opens a lot of doors. And I always hate when people say it's luck because it's not. Um, it's hard work and timing. And when he retires, it's like an Indian rain dance. Timing is timing everything. Is everything. <laughs> when when he retires, um, like what what is your thought at that time? And you'll think, hang on now, like there's there's movement here. Yeah, right. So the, the first thought is, you know, I'm newly married. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. We don't have a mortgage yet, but we've got a car payment now. Yeah. So my first thought is, oh my gosh, the world is ending. This world of politics is right. crazy. Will I ever work again? Yeah. Um, and after a lot of prayer. Another gentleman stepped up to run who JC was supporting, mm-hmm. Congressman Tom Cole, and he needed campaign staff. And so he kind of inherited all okay. of JC's team, and we all started working for Tom to help get him elected. Yeah. But we didn't know. Th- this was very different. Right? When I worked for JC, he was already an established, mm-hmm. you know, high ranking, fourth ranking member of Congress. Uh, Tom was, in, in many ways, lesser known at yeah. the time. Um, and so there was a real risk that I learned then about the kind of the risk of politics Mm -hmm. you do you do put it all on the line I mean we were my wife and I we were out campaigning putting up signs every day we were working yes we believed in Tom yes we believed in the message but we also had some things on the line. Like yeah. it was important to us that he got elected because we we needed to work and and we had kind of chosen his business. So while I during working for JC Yes, I was inspired that maybe political office could be yeah. in my future, but I thought that was way off and you know way off when I was old in my forties. I'm forty four right. now. I'm yeah. forty three, uh, but I thought that would be you know way off when I was much much older, mm-hmm. um, and it wound up being a lot sooner than I thought. Yeah, that's it's you're right you got to see two sides of campaigning right because you go for work with someone who's already established yep. you you're welcomed in the community already because they they believe he's already probably done some good things and 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 been truthful to what he what he said he would do and he's done it and like i said you go to work for a relatively unknown and you got to build that trust again mm-hmm. and get that word out and Absolutely. campaigning like i said it's not easy it's not easy you know? work at all no. So, so from that point then let's go forward to like you getting that shot and yeah. you saying I'm going for it. I'm going to campaign and and be the you know the next one that's elected. So, you know, Tom gets elected, worked mm-hmm. for him a couple of years. I finished law school around that time and my tribe, the Chickasaw Nation, mm-hmm. uh, then offers me to come work for them. Yeah. Um, and move to Ada. And again, I've got the bug about political office, but right. in my mind that's you know, 20 years away. Right. That, that, that's the way I, I thought yeah. you had to be in your 40s or 30s to run for office. That uh-huh. was just a, a misconception that I had. Yeah. Um, and so I finished law school and my tribe offered me a position to come work there. I was hired as a special assistant to the CEO. Uh-huh. Uh, after just a few months, though, they saw my performance and they yeah. offered me the position of chief administrative officer. So I was one of five sea yeah. level officers working there. I uh, did that a few years. My daughter's born. Uh, my wife and I were making a six figure. I'm like making a six figure salary. Yeah. We're living in like a four hundred seventy five dollar a month. Life is really good, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. it's just good. Uh, and I, that's when I really got the premonition uh, and and the inkling. Um, that I may want to run for office. And some guys, when I was in Washington, D.C. on a trip, some folks came to me and said, the state house seat where you grew up, House District 62, where your parents still live, the long-term incumbent there is term limited, and we think you should run. And again, I'm still thinking, I'm not old enough. Like, I don't have, I'm 20, I think I'm 26 years old at this time. 27, maybe. Yeah. And so I, um, I I prayed about it, and I told my wife, I think this is what God's calling me to do. I want to do it. And she yeah. said, well, let's go. And so we moved back to Lawton, uh, and I ran for office, yeah. and that would have been 2006 and got elected. During this time and all of this stuff's going yeah. on, what else are you into at this time? Like, I mean, we still haven't even sniffed banking yet. Yeah. Like, 
you know you're 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 in and and you like I said you can you you see your potential you have an opportunity I'm sure like your community and your church is happy to have you back and yep. they're proud of you that you know you yeah. are in this place yeah. of influence now and mum and dad are super happy and yep. and just kind of you have become everything that they said you were going to or you're on that path to um what is that time like and kind of where do you see yourself going from then like I said you you know for few four years later you become the speaker and and where is life at that point and and are you thinking i'm going to be a banker now or do you think i'm going to be a career career politician no no neither of the two um so i'm also a young father at the time Uh, my daughter's born in 2005 um, my son's born in 2009, so it, it's all hands on deck, you know. Yeah. And, and so we're, we're doing that. And, and then uh, one of the things that I did is because I was a young father, I drove back and forth from Lawton every day to the Capitol. Yeah. I didn't stay here in the city until I became Speaker of the House, really. Um, and so I, I that that was that was a pretty stressful time, just because yeah. you know you're you're a lot of time on the on the you know, H.E. Bailey Turnpike. And, mm-hmm. um, but, but I enjoyed every minute of it. I, I knew I was, I knew I was making a difference. I knew I was exactly where God wanted me to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, and I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, so, you know, parenting is really the bigger part of what I was doing there. And I was yeah. really committed to doing that job. I didn't know for sure what I would do after. Um, I knew, I knew I wasn't going to do 12 years. I, I liked right. it. I enjoyed what I was doing, but I didn't think 12 years was for me. And that's when I decided, well, maybe I should run for Speaker of the House. I didn't run for Speaker to become Speaker, though. As I mentioned, I was driving back and forth every day. Yeah. And running for Speaker, is a lot of it is a popularity. Like, it's just about relationships, right? And because I drove back and forth every night, a lot of the social stuff afterwards and, yeah. and like, I didn't do any of that. Right. I was at home, and so I just didn't have, I didn't, I didn't think I had enough relationships with members. I had, gotcha. I was affable. I got along with members, right. but I didn't feel like I had those deep connections because I just didn't put in the right. time yeah. there. I was, I was at a young family. I was driving back. I had an hour and a half drive, and they were all staying yeah. here in Oklahoma City, and at least many of them. I had another friend, uh, two of them. They actually drove back and forth to Tulsa. We we talk sometimes yeah. um, on the phone, headed back. But um, so I thought, well, I'll run for Speaker of the House, not thinking I could have yeah. a shot. And also, being Speaker of the House, I always thought was the worst job in state government. I right. mean, because you piss somebody off every single <laughs> every day. Time. Every yeah. single day, you're you know, a new yeah. group of people are mad at you. Right. But what I thought was, well, this is Oklahoma. I've got a law degree. Mm-hmm. What I don't have is oil and gas experience. So what I should become is oil and gas chairman or get, mm-hmm. try to at least get on that committee, get some oil and gas experience. Yeah. And then maybe afterwards, something in oil and gas makes sense. Maybe yeah. I'll have some some type of, of, of credibility in the oil and gas community. That yeah. was my thinking. So I thought I'd run for speaker and then not have enough votes. I had, I had 10 buddies. I thought, well, maybe I can bring yeah. them and then leverage that with whoever's ahead and right. throw all our votes there and become. And I remember the day I called my wife and said, oh my gosh, I think I'm going to be Speaker of the House. Like, this is completely backfired. Right. Uh, and sure enough, uh, I was. My colleagues elected me in 2000. Um, that would have been 2013. Well, yeah. the, the first, it's a weird process. The Speaker designate election mm-hmm. was just a caucus election. That would happen in 2011. Yeah. But you're not officially sworn in and, and voted by the entire chamber until gotcha. 2013. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it happens for a reason. It does. Right? I believe that. I mean, whether it's fake or anything, whatever yeah. it is, like yep. it happens for a reason, and you're put in that position to make a change uh, and to be an impact. You know, to have an impact uh, and those things. And and like you said, it, it completely backfired. But probably by the time that you got into it, you you're thinking, you know, like I said, there is a reason I'm here, and I get to voice. You know, you be the, you are the speaker. Yeah, it, it was an amazing opportunity. I mean, I always tell people. It's by far the hardest thing I've ever done, Mm -hmm. but I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, um, You you do have a chance to, you know, in Oklahoma, our Constitution, because we're such a populous state, um, we vest very little authority into the governor's mansion. Right. The, the, the executive branch is not the most powerful branch of government in Oklahoma. The legislature is. And so the Speaker of the House really carries a big stick in Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't fully appreciate that. As I mentioned to you, I, I didn't yeah. show up wanting to be Speaker of the House, quite the opposite. Yeah. Um, and I learned very quickly that 
the speaker has an enormous sway over how you um, influence policy and how legislation moves. And so I had to very quickly decide, okay, what are the things that are most important? I mean, there are so many issues that right. you want to address. I mean, the problem is not finding an issue. It's narrowing it to yeah. which one. And um, I finally decided, okay, you know, if we want to move this state forward, you have to do a couple of things. And so some of the things I'm most proud of, I did author the legislation to create Oklahoma's workers' compensation mm -hmm. system that moved it from the adversarial judicial yeah. um, kind of service where you, you know, if you get injured, the first place you end up is in court. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew as an attorney, that's expensive. Yes. Yeah. So we were the last state in the union to move it to administrative system. Mm -hmm. And each year, and I get emails now as a, as a business um, owner myself, I get, you know, where workers' compensation rates go down 10 to 12 percent every year. Mm -hmm. That's because, I mean, that, you feel like yeah. you had an impact there, right. you know, that's the end, because we, we did that. Um, I also knew that, you know, the value of hard work, and that's why we fought real hard to reform welfare and, okay. and to re make a re work requirement, require 20 hours of work for anybody receiving welfare benefits mm -hmm. who's of able body. Now, disability is different. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're a disabled right. person, a person with physical challenges or mental, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But if you're able-bodied, the system should not be supporting you for life. I don't care who right. you are. I don't care what your story is. It's yeah. not designed that way, and it's not good for you. Mm -hmm. um, not only is it not good for the system, it's not good for the person yeah. because it robs people of their human dignity. Mm -hmm. And and then the last thing that was really important to me was just I knew we had a high rate of, of incarcerated individuals. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, of um, orphaned individuals, a lot of them because of incarceration okay. uh, rates. And so I, we passed, we were the first state in the union uh, with legislation that I authored to allow a $5,000 tax credit for adoption and foster children okay. uh, for, for people who engage in that just because... Yeah. Um, I think it matters. You know, every parent, every child didn't have the parents that I grew up with, right. but every child should. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Mm -hmm. And it, you're right. And like, like I said, the, back to the statistics, right? You, you know, there's plenty of people out there who are a statistic because of you don't, you don't have a strong environment growing up. Um, and it's just kind of changing that however way it is. And by that, that credit, it make, you know, it, to some people, $5,000 isn't a lot of money, but to others, it's, you know, it's a, it's a significant amount of money and it makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Moving forward then to, to the bank, right, and how you become where you're at. Um, I mean, touch on, I guess, how quickly you get in, you know, how you get into this position. And then I want to dive into the work that you've done through the bank and social yeah. media. You bet. So um, elected to the Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. 2013, uh, served at 13 and 14, yeah. uh, made an unsuccessful bid for U.S. Senate in 14. After that, I, you know, went, moved, we moved to Tulsa and I did some mm -hmm. investment banking work with the group uh, for a while. And that's when I got the call uh, from Governor Anatubby about coming to work at Chickasaw Community Bank. Now, it was interesting uh, time because I had worked um, I, well, I volunteered, but I was real active on the Trump campaign mm -hmm. in 2015, I guess it would have been, uh, or 16. And I got a chance to go interview literally in three days. Yeah. I got a call. These three events happened to me in three days. And if most people, I'm glad that there's some at least some news coverage of it because people probably wouldn't believe me. In three, day, three days, I got a call from Harvard University to become a fellow to come lead a course there for a semester. Yeah. I got a call to come interview with the newly elected president of the United States, and then I got a call from Governor Anatubby to come be the president of a bank. Yeah. It happened over a three-day time period, and that's where you're going, yeah, I know me. <laughs> I'm really not, uh, you know, yeah. I, I, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm less than... than uh, you know, I know that there are people a lot more deserving of all of those amazing opportunities. And uh, I said yes to every one of them. So I went yeah. to, flew to uh, New York and met with President Donald Trump. I was one of the first 13 people after he's elected yeah. uh, to meet with. He interviewed me about becoming um, the secretary of HUD, Housing and Urban Development. And um, it, it, the position eventually went to um, Dr. Ben Carson. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... I accepted a fellowship 
to go lead a course at at, at Harvard University. I took uh-huh. my family in 2017. We yeah. stayed there. Uh, it was an amazing opportunity. We did it on the GOP and minorities, why we need each other. That sure. was the course that, that we led in the uh, Kennedy um, uh, in the Kennedy School of Politics. Uh-huh. And then I told Governor Anatoly, yes, I, I'd be willing to come be the president of the bank. And I said, but you know I've never run a bank before, right? Yeah. And he said, we know that, but uh, we have good bankers, and but we know that you, you, you've been in business, mm-hmm. you understand relationships, and you understand leadership. And that's yeah. what we're looking for. And I said, well, I've done that before. And so uh, it took about a year of a little bit of imposter syndrome where yeah, you think, yeah, yeah. oh, my gosh. Is this the day they walk in and figure out how incompetent I am? You know, is this the day? Every day was like that. <laughs> but after about a year, yeah. and you realize, all right, we're having some success. We're having some growth. Mm-hmm. Um, I was supposed to have a, uh, when we first talked, there would be like a, you know, at least a three-year yeah. um, um, transition period between me and, and, and kind of succession planning yeah. but between the guy that my predecessor in the seat it wound up being much less instead of having three years I think I had six months um, and, and <laughs> he's so, like I'm done I'm yeah, out yeah, so, yeah, you're so, on your own so, so about a year yeah. um, um, you know of, of just kind of wondering and self doubt and wonder it took right. me about a year when I finally just said okay listen you've been given an amazing opportunity yeah You've got an amazing team. I knew I knew how to build a team. I can I can build good teams. If I have a superpower, right. that's it. I know how to build a good team. Yeah. Um, and to put people in roles where they can thrive. That that's, that's it, what yeah. I do um, yeah. best. And I figured out okay, the skill set that you have is transferable. Mm-hmm. I wasn't sure that the things I had done owning my own business and public relations, or, yeah. or even working for the chief administrative officer as mm-hmm. the tribe, or or even you know leading a you know, eight yeah. billion dollar budget for the state of Oklahoma. Um, I didn't know for sure if those skills transferred to mm-hmm. probably the most regulated business in the country, which right. is which is banking. They do. Um, if you can inspire a team, mm-hmm. set set goals, and hold people accountable, you can you can right. you can lead an, an organization. It doesn't matter what the organization is. Widget making. Now, I had to spend some time, yeah. you know, learning about widget making, uh, about banking, and and but but it's not rocket science. It's not it's not rocket surgery. Yeah. As, uh, as once was said, it, <laughs> it's it, it, it's the overall the goal is, you know, you you take local deposits, you make local loans. Yeah. Don't pay more for your deposits than you're charging for your loans. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing how it works out. So, and we've had great success. We've grown. Literally, when I got here, the bank was a hundred and it, it, the bank had grown. For 17 years, mm-hmm. and it had grown from a seven million dollar investment to 113 over 17 years. Yeah. We grew from 113 million when I got here to now 350 million in four years. Amazing! So it's been, yeah. it's been, and it's and it's good growth. I mean, we have the most, um, we have the strongest portfolio this bank's ever had. They're yeah. solid loans. We have amazing customers, but it's because we have an amazing team. Before we finish up, though, I want to go back because this is going to be a two-part podcast because there's so much more to talk about regarding the bank's future Sorry, and I went everything. On so long. No, no, it's not. It, it's, you're not the first person that we've done two parts, so you're good. Um, I, what is it like walking in to the meet the president of the United States, regardless of who he is? Walking in, you know, from from a from a boy growing up in Lawton, Oklahoma yeah. and the journey that we've just talked about that you've gone through being a person of influence and whatever it is and going and Cameron and OCU and JC Watts and everything and being the speaker and then you are walking through the door and the president of the United States is the other side of that door. Yeah. Take me to that feeling. Yeah. It's um, it, it's a humbling experience mm-hmm. and you do and, and so one of the things I've tried to do most of my life and I and I think I've done pretty well is to try to be in the moment, yeah. right? To, to to be present, like and to actually take in what it means, mm-hmm. and to and to feel it and and to own it. And yeah. so, um, in those moments, the things that I'm thinking about, and because I've had a chance, I'd met President uh, George W. Bush mm-hmm. before, uh, so I've I met two sitting presidents before, and mm-hmm. and, and but I've met a lot of other elected officials. Uh, the things that it is humbling when you're meeting with the leader of the free world. I mean, right. you do recognize what that means, but it's also a reminder of man. People are people. Right? Yeah. Like at the end of the day, 
we're all created in the image of God. And I think that's when I, when I think about our society and the challenges we have, and you know, there's so much about equality and equity and inequality and mm-hmm. inequity. And, and, and I think we should work, work on making sure that people are valued for who they are and about the content of their character, right. not the color of their skin. However, I think there's only one place where every single person is equal mm-hmm. among themselves. And that's in the presence of God. And I think when you remove a higher being, your, your God out of your society, yeah. that's when people start creating these goofy, you know, fiefdoms and these goofy hierarchies. And so walking in to meet, you know, President Donald Trump, knowing that you're interviewing for a job, you just don't know what to expect because right. this is a guy that I've known of my entire life. So this is different than other presidents that kind of, you know, they kind of emerge and you kind of get to know them over 18 months. I've known of him my entire life. I remember him being interviewed by Oprah Winfrey and being on the Phil Donahue show. Now I'm really dating myself. So you, you at least you, you at least know of him. Um, and so I walk in and and we, we, when we're there, because we're all being interviewed and uh, Chris Christie's there, Bob Johnson, the first African-American male, billionaires there. Um, who else is in the room? There, there, there's some other. Um, Mayor Giuliani is in the room. They're all. We're all kind of in the yeah. in the line. And you're like, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> like, like, come on. Uh, but you know, you try to look dignified, yeah, of and, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And, and look as if you belong. And yeah. and I've certainly looked that part before, or tried to look that part before. And so th- when we walk mm-hmm. in, you had to walk. They told us that there would be a a press opportunity. So we yeah. we're at we're at Trump's place. And New Jersey, um, the and, and so we walked by the press, and he said, "When you get up there, the president's going to want to stop mm-hmm. before you walk in because we're outside. You're walking outside, and it's cold." And yeah. he said, "He's going to want to stop there for the press opportunity." And so we did. And uh, when I shake his hand, you know, you're, you're a little bit starstruck because you know he, he, right. he he's, you've just seen this face all the time. And the first thing he says is, "You're taller than I thought. You're taller than me." And I said, well, let me fix that, Mr. President. And I stepped down on a step because yeah. we're walking up these steps to get to the house. And we turned to the camera and he said, boy, you really are good. You know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so because yeah. I think I have about he's a tall guy, too. Yeah. And I think I have about an inch or a half an right. inch on him. And, uh, he, and so in the picture, though, he looks like the tall guy for sure. Uh, but then we walk in. And there's this uh, meeting. Now, I know Reince Priebus. That Reince is a friend of mine. I've known him for years. That's who called me to interview with the president that said, we think we could use your talents. And yeah. he, the president of the United States wants to meet the president-elect. He yeah. wasn't sworn in yet as president, but he had been elected. Um, so I walk in. Reince is there. And sitting behind the president was a was a gentleman, a young gentleman. And I thought, well, it must be an intern. or mm-hmm. you know. But he was sitting kind of behind him. Kind of almost in the shadows, almost yeah. kind of taking notes. And later on, I find out it's Jared Kushner because I didn't know who Jared Kushner right. was at the time. Uh, so we had a great interview. I f- figured out very quickly he's a very fast paced guy. He makes you feel like the most important person in the room. I mean, he's totally listening and he's totally, yeah. you can tell he's evaluating very, very quickly about your ability. Yeah. And I probably bl- blew the interview a little bit. Ryan's didn't tell me exactly what I was being interviewed for. He said he wants to talk to you about a cabinet position. I was yeah. like, well, which one? Well, yeah. And uh, he said, well, well, we'll see. We don't know yet. And he said, but before I walked in, he said, well, would you consider housing and urban development? And yeah. I thought, well, yeah, but in my mind, I'm thinking I'm from Oklahoma, oil and gas right. state. Yeah. I'm an enrolled tribal member, a, a state with tribal presence. I thought yeah. interior made sense. So uh-huh. when they asked me about I probably blew the interview, as a matter of fact, because yeah. when he asked me about the president, I said, well, uh, what's your philosophy on HUD? And I said, well, you know, funny you ask, I, I believe getting people, moving people from generational poverty in the middle class is the most important thing we can do yeah. uh, because it changes people's lives. I said, however, being from an oil and gas state with a high presence of Native Americans, mm-hmm. I really think interior has a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, influence on people's lives to you know keep yeah. an energy cost low, blah 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 yeah, blah. Yeah. So anyway, um, it was an amazing experience. And when you first get there, you know, at first I told my wife before I left, I said, you know, just being called, oh well, yeah, is like Having that an phone amazing. Call. Yeah, yeah. So first it's that I said then, and then it was well. I think I'll then I call her I said you know anything they offer I'd just be yeah. honored to serve it doesn't matter right. I said but it quickly your ego kicks in a little bit and it's because then I was thinking you know 
I could probably do Mike Pence's job. I'd make a pretty good <laughs> VP, actually. So, you know, it, it yeah, escalated yeah. very, very quickly. But I would, at the end of the day, it was just amazing to be honored and, yeah. um, and got to meet a lot of amazing people. And every now and then I would get calls from kind of people in the circle about what do you think about this? And I felt yeah. like I felt like I had a voice. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. special. And, and back, it was amazing. And, yeah, it is. And, and back to just like, you know, like I said, like, like I said earlier, growing up as that kid, right? And you're like, I yeah. don't really know what I'm going to do, but this, my community and my church tells me I'm going to be in a place of influence. I'm going to have do great things. And, you know, that's a perfect example of just being, getting that phone call and, and still getting phone calls and asking for advice. That, that's awesome. Um, we're touching on an hour. Uh, it's going to be a two-part podcast for everyone listening. I'm going to come back and, and finish up and talk about Chicksaw Community Bank, um, the tribe as general, and uh, in general, just the community and the impact the tribe has, not only in Oklahoma, but, you know, surrounding as well. Um, touch on the Hall of Fame a little bit. So that'll be in part two but tw thanks so much for your time we'll schedule a time to come back and finish this up i'm excited to hear more about it we'll dive into as you mentioned earlier love of cars and fashion we've got to talk about that <laughs> um, as well as social media so for part one uh we're done here uh, and for people listening look forward to part two and we will catch you next episode cheers this podcast is presented by the oklahoma hall of fame telling an oklahoma story through its people since 1927 for more information on the hall of fame go to www.oklahoma.com hof.com and follow them on instagram for daily updates at oklahoma hof thank you for listening we are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories for more great oklahoma content Follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.